Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. We have a great guest this evening, uh, Emily Louise, and she has a great YouTube channel and touches on this topic occasionally and has sorted through uh, a number of myths and things like that. We're going to be talking to her about that and uh, uh, and a couple of other things, you know, behind the scenes here. I'm going to tell you that uh, coming up on May 7th, I'm pretty excited to announce because a number of people have said to me in the last several months asking me to connect uh, Mike Herrera and uh, Jonathan Wygant because they were both former Marines. They went through a very similar experience. So I did connect them and they've been having a conversation for several months. And on May 7th, they're both going to be on this show here on this channel. So I'm really looking forward to have uh, both of them. And I, pardon me for the, I put that picture together at the last minute. So it's, it's uh, not all that good, but uh, we'll uh, have a great show. And again, that's May 7th. Look forward to that. Right after this show, right at eight o'clock sharp Eastern time, I'm going to be on with Mark D'Antonio and Forrest Crawford. And we're going to be talking about the Ozark Mountain UFO conference, which I will be attending along with my producer, Donna, really looking forward to meeting uh, any of you that are showing up there. And uh, we're going to be talking about that, plus uh, some other things I don't know for us, but from what I understand, he's a very interesting person. And so I'll be uh, asking him how he got involved in the UFO world. Uh, also, at uh, Contact in the Desert, um, for this, uh, until this weekend, that you can get 10% off with this code, with this code, uh, Easter 10, and that expires on 331. So uh, just passing that along, anyone that's going to go there has not bought their ticket, it'd be a good time to buy it. And let's see, lastly, our our blog this week by Charles is remembering saucerologist, ufologist, Ted Blocher. Uh, and so check that out. He was around, I think it's actually uh, maybe Bleacher the way that might be a German name. And uh, so check that out. It's another really good blog by uh, Charles, who, by the way, is coming out with a book shortly. It should be another book, should be out within uh, the next couple of months. So without further ado, Emily, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me, Martin. Yes, thank you Hello. for staying up late, although you say you're kind of on that time. Anyway. I am a true night owl. That's good. That's good. So I got a, I got contacted, I don't know, a number of months ago. I guess you were in the States at the time uh, by my good friend, uh, Chris Lambright. And he mentioned, hey, you got to have this woman on the show. She's doing a great job. And so you are, you've, uh, you've created a lot of really interesting videos and uh, you've touched on all kinds of topics, but UFOs is one of them. Yeah, lots. So I kind of started um, making videos just about like kind of general weird um, stories. Kind of started off doing like a a video like on uh, one of the classic Art Bell phone calls, the Mel's Hole story. If you're familiar with that, um, and then oh. kind of then kind of just went into the world of um, religious cults mm -hmm. and um, through kind of looking at um a lot of kind of uh, early like new age um religious cults then then kind of pivoted a little bit into ufo world um and yeah and just covering all, all manner of like strange strange topics uh -huh. now uh we chatted a little bit you know before we started the show and and your your approach is not as a debunker but you treat everything with skepticism but also an open mind yeah so, like uh, how yeah. what i would say to be like a healthy skepticism right so like i've got my own personal beliefs um I, i'm kind of like i'm very conflicted about my own personal beliefs when it comes to like ufo phenomena because i used to be a real hardcore believer um i was a big big believer in kind of like the area 51 um bob lazar story i was a big believer in um roswell a lot of you know all, all of like the big kind of um well-known ufo law i was a big believer of and like a and you know still have a a lot of like 
maybe love is the wrong word now, but I have a lot of not like nostalgia for those stories. You know, like I've been to Area 51 a couple of times. I've been to Roswell, I've been to all the UFO museums. Like there's a part of me that really loves it. But there's also a part of me that has what I would call a healthy skepticism, i.e. not like discounting everything out of hand and not being what I would what I would call like a hardcore debunker. Mm. Um, I'm not necessarily, like I was saying to you before, like I'm not really interested in like picking apart regular people's stories. If somebody sees a, sees something or has an encounter or has like a um, kind of what would be called like a, a high strange experience, um, but there's there's certain elements um, of the UFO topic that I think uh, are, require um, a little bit more uh, attention. So yeah, uh-huh. uh, we have Mario Woods in oh, the hi, uh, Mario. chat room. Yeah, great guy. I I spoke to Mario actually um, not too long ago. We oh, you have spoke. yeah yeah yeah. We yeah. we found out that um, in my the, where I live in the uh, colder months. I'm only uh, like an hour and 15 minutes away. We're going to get together. He's a great guy. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, he's yeah. A, he is a nice guy. Yes, absolutely. So uh, one of the stories that you – now, I, ha I have not been able to watch this just because I was in the middle of a move and everything, but um, is Dulcie 1 mm -hmm. and 2. And this is, uh, this is one of the things that I have seen uh, many times over the years that – something kind of takes on a life of its own and like a, a myth becomes reality when it's repeated enough, you know, and people seem to think, you know, there's an underground base there with bodies and jars and there was a battle there between aliens yeah. and people <laughs> and all that. And, uh, but you, but uh, I know that Chris Lambright, uh, who's listening now that he actually uh, researched that pretty deep and just found the roots of it. And I'm sure that's what you came into. And if you would, I'd kind of like to go over that, first of all, for the person that has never heard the story, oh, gosh. Uh, as much as you remember <laughs> of it. I know it's uh, off I mean, the top I, of my head. Um, well, the whole kind of thing started with, with um, cattle mutilations in the late 70s on um, the ranch of Manuel Gomez. There was a lot of kind of kind of strange elements um elements to it and and then um Gabe Valdez got involved um who was a local uh police officer out in Dulce I'm trying to remember this off my head so please forgive me if I if I mess up any of the important <laughs> details um but yeah it started with a spate of, of cattle mutilations and then kind of evolved um and took on very much a life of its own um, because there was it, it was also part of like a, a larger wave of cattle mutilations like in the in the 1970s that was very much like a, a very kind of big thing that was happening um, and it was also very much um, in the news and there were a lot of different people that got involved in it. And um, in 1979, there was a cattle mutilation conference. I believe it was in Albuquerque. Harrison Schmidt, um, who was, I believe, the senator, also uh, one of the guys that landed on the moon, um, held this conference. Um, and it's at this conference where um, people like Christian Lambright and other researchers have speculated that um, Paul Benowitz um, may have become like the, a target for disinformation. Um, he then kind of links up with Gabe Valdez and starts investigating these cattle mutilations that are happening out in the Dulce area. He has like this... Um, real interest this is before he's kind of on his roof viewing whatever oh, yeah. it was that he was viewing um mm -hmm. he's kind of going back and forth to the dulce area um for quite a while um investigating these cattle mutilations and linking up with um with gabe valdez and eventually you know the whole kind of paul benowitz scenario unravels and he witnesses um uh, objects on while he's on his roof he witnesses um 
I mean, I, I can't really say what they were. They, they were definitely something. He took photographs of them. Um, so, so he definitely, he wasn't imagining things. They were definitely there. Whether or not it was some sort of um, kind of uh, top secret military craft, whether it was something extraterrestrial, that people can speculate about that all day long. But the, the fact of the matter was he did take photographs of them. Um, he reported them to the, to, the Air Force, he thought that he was doing, you know, like the right thing that he thought because they were above Kirtland Air Force Base um, and he lived like almost adjacent to Kirtland Air Force Base. Um, he reported them and um, suddenly became victim of uh, a quite elaborate disinformation campaign that involved um, Richard Doty, but also God knows how many other people that we don't know the names of that were involved. Mm. Um, and some of it involved um, trying to draw uh, his attention away from whatever it was that he was seeing at Kirtland Air Force Base. So um, because he had this involvement up in Dulce, um, looking at these cattle mutilations, which are strange in themselves, and there's been a lot of speculation as to who was doing them. Um, I think that it's most like it's more likely that there was some sort of like government involvement versus any kind of like extraterrestrial involvement. Um, but they they kind of to divert his attention away from Kirtland Air Force Base. Um, they would kind of put eyes on Dulcy um, more. So there was there's a lot of like kind of rumors about and speculation about. Um, them when i say them i mean like air force intelligence rick doty whoever you want to say it was um making it look like there was uh some sort of base up there um yeah. crashed sources up there um he was paul was a uh pilot as well so he would go up and kind of scope the land um up there in his helicopter um so yeah, that that's kind of like the origins of this this Dulce story. It kind of starts with Paul Banowitz because um, this disinformation campaign really kind of started him on this downward spiral. Right. A lot of people like to say that he was mentally unwell beforehand, or that he was already like in a in a not very good state. He he really just had a belief in extraterrestrials and then all of this kind of madness spiraled out from that um ever since he got involved with with the air force and it was only when he started really like writing letters to senators and trying to get attention um of these things that he he had seen that this disinformation campaign kind of kicked into gear um and i think it's like there's speculation that he what he was looking what he was seeing could have been um I want to say like the F117A um, stealth, like stealth technology that he was seeing. Hmm. Yeah, sorry, it's a bit of a whirlwind <laughs> yeah. that I'm going on a bit ranty. But yeah, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the origins of but it. But also, <laughs> and I mentioned earlier that wasn't some woman involved, and she was interviewed saying that uh, that started the rumor part that had to do with the you know the battle between the aliens and all that or was that or was that the um i'm trying to think he he is it man passed Hansen? away uh who's it was it mana hansen that you're thinking of it may have been i know chris uh, chris he's in chat maybe chris will put it in the chat mana hansen or claimed to have been abducted um she she um came to the attention she reported it i believe to gabe valdez and then um through Gabe's relationship with Paul, Paul then became aware of this abduction and they did um, hypnotic regressions in Paul Benowitz's car with tin foil on the windows. It's like a, a, a detail that always gets um, brought up. And um, through those regressions, I believe that she um, described some form of underground base. And they they then from that point um, it was believed that there was some kind of base there. Um, but if, if you talk to Rick Doty about it, Rick Doty will say that she actually what she um, described was an underground 
like an underground area at Kirtland Air Force Base. Mm. Um, yeah. And when it comes to the Phil Schneider stuff, like yeah, that's, that's what I was just gonna. Of, yeah, I was just uh, yeah. had this question here, and that's who I was thinking of, Phil Schneider. Yes, he he kind of t takes this story. So then it like throughout the uh, this is kind of happening very early eighties, and then towards the late eighties when you kind of get your um get your kind of Bill Coopers coming into the mix. You know these kind of your Bill Coopers, your John Lears, this kind of very like dark side of ufology. That's when people like Phil Schneider come in. I'm not 100% familiar with Phil Schneider's claims. All I know is that he claimed to have worked at Dulce Underground Base and that's where there was a there was an alien war and he lost yes. and he lose like half of his hand or something. With a, yes, and, and <laughs> I guess uh, some people have found uh, a picture of him in high school with that part of his hand was also missing at that time. So yeah. that story kind of <laughs> fell apart there. Yeah. 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 But anyway, uh, all very interesting. And it's it's so hard to really understand, you know, what's real and what's not when it comes to some of these stories. And, Absolutely. Uh, and Dulcie's a, a great example of that. For sure. Absolutely, because it because because it's very um, worked into this disinformation campaign. Um, it it's kind of yeah, it becomes almost impossible to figure out what the actual truth is. And a lot of these stories also work like folklore, so they get kind of passed from one person to the other, and yeah. another person puts a twist on it. And and yeah. the further it gets down the line, the harder it is to actually discern where it started what the root of it is and and what the actual truth is. And, you know, it's not my place here to say anything really negative about anyone, but Rick Doty, uh, I just don't understand why people give him so much credit. Like he's in a lot of films, like as the alien guy and, yeah. and all this. And um, he was just someone passing disinformation. Uh, I don't think he has any, more knowledge about anything other than than that and um, no i agree with yeah. you and yeah. he's he does have himself a nice um cushy little uh gig now on um a few like ufo live shows where i saw that yeah and uh so i i just got to tell this to you and my audience is that rick Doty was going to be on this show um my friend alejandro rojas was upset with me but i said no i want to have him on but I'm going to have him on. And the only way I'll have him on is I contacted him and I said, I, I would, I'm glad you'll be on the show, but I have to know this is anything off limits because I'd like to be able to talk about anything I want to. And that meant I wanted to talk about the Paul Beno Benowitz mm -hmm. case and Van Boos, he's gone. And uh, he's, you know, like uh, when I have contacted him since then, He'll say, well, I'm busy for the next three months. And then I see him on someone's live show, you know, so, uh, so I know he's, yeah. he's not, yeah, he just doesn't I want. I think that yeah. he kind of, he will, he will um, go on a, I interviewed him um, for my uh, YouTube series oh. um, that still isn't finished. Um, he's actually, a very small clip of it is in the Dulcie video, but I, um, yeah, I interviewed him. It, first of all, I will say this, it, first of all, he asked me for money. Um, so that he didn't do anything without money, <laughs> and then um, and then I said, "Well, I'm, I'm, I'm independent. I literally just make these videos in my bedroom. I can't, I can't pay you anything." Um, and he finally he agreed to it, and we talked for about two, about nearly about three hours. But oh, through wow. through portions of it, you know, like a lot of the questions I had were very like. Um, I don't want to say that he maybe he wasn't expecting them, but they were very kind of like uh, like very like granular details, and a lot of the questions would be answered with, "You wouldn't understand. It would take me forever to try and explain it to you." At one point, he said that I would uh, never be able to work in intelligence. That was after I asked him if he had any regrets about, um, you know, being involved in the mental breakdown of a man mm -hmm. and his response was it's my job you know no real remorse for it um so well yeah, he's you a know he's a character yeah. i i it, not to stand up for him but i i understand that that's he's possibly saying the truth right there that it probably was his job to do what mm -hmm. he did but um but oh, not yeah, to, I, I, I can't I, imagine yeah. uh, being involved in destroying someone's 
life and then not having any regrets but maybe you know uh, exactly and then to yeah. and then to also you know you could then make the argument that afterwards he's just gone on to spread that disinformation on an even larger scale because i look at some of the shows that he's on and they get you know like 300 400 people watching live at any one time and it's an it's an audience that are enraptured it's an audience that really want to believe and i don't blame them for wanting to believe because like a, a lot of us do have questions about what ufos are are you are do ufos exist you know a lot of people have these questions and interests and i don't blame anybody to sit there and be interested in what he says but he's a known disinformation agent and i do think that he is um still dish, dishing out disinformation whether or not it's just for his own financial gain or whether it's for another purpose i couldn't tell you but um yeah, yeah, it's it's disturbing because he's got, he's got a lot of people that um kind of follow him around and defend him a lot. So yeah, yeah, you you find that, and there's you know if you've taken any time to look into this, you know the culture of UFOs, you will see that there's yeah. just like everything else in the world, there's a lot of divisiveness. There's you know black and white and me against you and yes. and, and all that, unfortunately. So. Um, you know, I, I, I guess we could uh, go from that into what other things do you think are, are myths that you've looked into? Oh, gosh. I mean, I mean there's just, there's, there's, so one project that I kind of took a really long time to um, research was uh, I got really interested in this whole idea of like the secret space program and super oh, yeah. soldiers. Mm -hmm. And and this, like, uh, I was really interested in like people like um, Corey Good and David oh, Wilcock, yes. people that kind of spread these kind of ideas and mm -hmm. where they came from. Um, so I put together one of the... Um, one of the documentaries on my channel is called uh, Alternative 3, How a Hoax Documentary Created a Conspiracy Cult. And in that, um, a start, the starting point is um, this 1977 hoax documentary called Alternative 3, which aired in the UK. Um, and it's totally fictional, but it was presented like uh, like it was real. And the whole idea of it was that people were being taken and shipped to Mars. And in it, um, they had a uh, fake um, Mars landing footage right at the uh, right at the very end. So um, I kind of took that as the starting point, and then. Um, tried to follow how that had influenced um people in the ufo field and because it had only aired so it was supposed to air on april 1st on april fool's day and it um because of scheduling things and there was a lot of strikes going on labor strikes um it had got pushed back to june so that had already kind of muddied the waters between fact and fiction right so mm. it comes out in june and it only airs once and it also it airs, I think, in Canada. I don't think it ever aired in the US. But the word got around about it. And people started to speculate about it. People like Gray Barker, there are a few other UFO zines that started to speculate about this documentary and it being real, right? So people, it was no longer this hoax thing that had been created in a studio. It was now actually real footage of a landing on Mars. And um, through <laughs> and throughout tracing the history of it, um, you can start to see the influence of this alternative three story in so many places. And it start and and like the the way that it um, like folklore over the years, kind of turned from this one hoax documentary into and also it was a book as well, um, from this one hoax documentary into. Um, the modern day iteration of it is people like Corey Good, um, who claimed to have gone away um, from the earth for 20 years and then they come back um, and then their age regressed into their um, into their bodies again and and it turns into all all manner of weirdness and it's also it like and throughout the creation of like this whole kind of secret space program myth and I'm not saying I want to like put a um 
disclaimer, I'm not saying that there's not any form of secret space program. I'm purely referring to like this the secret space program conspiracies, you know, like people like James Rink on Super Soldier Talk, these people that kind of sit online, they have like online shows and they think that they are super soldiers. Um, but through the creation of um from this alternative three documentary and then it also like over the years picks up like very real things um like project stargate for example um the first earth battalion which was actually trying to create super soldiers um remote viewing all of that kind of stuff and all of these things kind of like all come together and they all start to become um this uh, secret space program conspiracy uh-huh. yeah, yeah. Yeah, wild. so so I'm I'm playing uh, for the person watching on YouTube and Facebook, etc. Et um, I'm putting up one of your videos just to play in the background because I want people to see how much work you put into these things. They're they're yeah, absolutely they're really great. Um, I, that's one yeah, thing I take, noticed right away. They take quite a while to like research and stuff, and I'm just a one person band. So I and I try to um like for example um some of the projects that I'm hoping to have out at some point this year you know I interview people as well which I think is um an important part of this so um for example like like Mario in the chat I've spoken to him um regarding um his experiences at Ellsworth Air Force Base um for a video yes. that will be about Ellsworth um so I think it's important you know like for me, I'm I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I'm a bit like very like detail orientated. So I try and like it's it's usually like a hindrance. Actually, I put too much too much time into it. Yes, well, um, you can tell you put a lot of time in. I mean, these are the shows like you you're starting to do, like I am right now with you, uh, is kind of a no brainer. You you just do it. It's in the can and done, and <laughs> and move on to the next thing. But you know what I think. Um, I think I'm going to open up the phones because we have a couple of people and I'm going to ask Mario um, if he'll call in, but uh, for, I know uh, Chris has said that he would call in and that number's up on the screen right now. That's 855-472-5483. And uh, Chanel will be standing by. Um, I'm just going to make a note to her right now. So uh, how that works is uh, you, you call in, Chanel will quickly screen you, just need your name, where you're calling from, and uh, we will bring you into the show. I have questions for our guest tonight, Emily. And uh, so, yeah, they're, the secret space program and all that, mm-hmm. um, that is something that I've mentioned this also to you uh, before we went live, and that is... I did a talk with some amateur astronomers and uh, basically what happened was they, you know, that question came up. What about the secret space program? And then, so I said, well, I don't really think that's a a real thing. You know I mean? These people are making these fantastical stories, Uh, but also they said, well, what does is, was face us the new uh, USA space force created to protect us against UFOs. And I said, well, I, I don't think so. You know, maybe that's part of a discussion here and there, but I don't think that's in any part of it because, you know, you really don't hear a lot of people saying that there's nefarious things going on. Every once in a while you hear about it, but it doesn't seem like, uh, you know, I mean, if they have the cap- capabilities to get here, mm-hmm. wherever they came from, you know, then they could certainly do a lot of damage if they wanted to um i i get i mean i guess so i also think you know like things like space force and stuff like that i i i my own reading of that is is that it's more about um uh trying to make sure that certain countries are the first to you know um for want of a better word you know like colonize space and like the whole idea of like going and gonna go put bases on the moon colonize the moon uh go to you know elon musk obsessed with going to mars um Mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff so 
Yeah. So when I said like I I'm not aver like averse to there being some sort of like secret space program that we don't know about, but I don't think that um people are being taken as children shipped out to Mars to fight uh, Draco reptilians. I don't think that that's happening. Of course, oh, really? I don't know. That's not. the one I believed in. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No. Yeah. I I just um it all gets a little bit fantastical from there on out. I mean, you never know. You you, you never know. But um, I just think from the from the evidence that we have, um, it's not something that you can prove. And I think what you can prove is that a lot of those claims um, come from a long line of, uh, I, I, hate to, I, I hate to say like fake stories, but like, you know, it's a lot of people like that make up stories. For whatever reason, be it um, disinformation, be it just a straight up hoax, just people, you know, just having a laugh, making hoaxes. Um, hard to say sometimes. Well, you know, uh, oh, we, I think we got Mario. We got Mario on. So I'm going to bring uh, bring him in right now. Mario, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. How are you, Martin? Emily Louise, how are you? Hi. Hi. Great to hear your voice, Mario. I'm glad I'm glad you yeah, called in. Well, it was just a it was a pleasure. I just had the notification and I just popped in there. I just walked in from work and I went, Oh wow, there's Emily <laughs> Louise and there's Martin, two of my favorite people. All right. <laughs> well, yeah. Then you brought up the then you brought up the Doty thing, and I just I knew I had to call in then. I was gonna do it anyway. <laughs> oh my you were very familiar. Yeah, you know, it's just an amazing thing to me that in 1977, this guy, as an airman first class, I was a senior airman at the time, so I outranked him, and he was one of the five people that were sitting on my left when I was when I went into my commander's office, Colonel Spraker, that morning. And it, it took me five years. First of all, I saw him on that Mirage Men or something like that. And, and oh, yes. I yeah. not know who that guy is. And then, of course, on Ancient Aliens. And I said, I got a, a contact with this guy. He's really the only person uh, that I have located so far because we've still not located Michael Johnson. And Arrow is looking for him. They have investigators looking for him everywhere. But why can't they find him? They've got his social security number. Hmm. And well, I just I, just I just him. quickly, Mario, just so someone understands um, who this person is. Uh, this is someone that you experienced and at Ellsworth um, back in the late seventies, your, your incident over a nuclear warhead. That's correct. Yeah. This object was sitting directly over uh, November five, which was a Minuteman two uh, missile, uh, 1.2 megaton weapon. And it was directly over the blast door between five and 10 feet in the air. And it was the size of say, I've always used a uh, Walmart building because everybody has seen a Walmart building. But if I wanted to apply it to a military craft, I would say an aircraft carrier, two of them put together into a sphere, a ball hmm. sitting just that close to the ground. But, you know, again, Rick Doty was an OSI guy. I'd never met that guy. You always wanted to stay away from OSI and I was a security policeman. So they're the people who investigate us when something goes wrong with security police or law enforcement. They're the ones who do the investigations. I mean, they do it, you know, service wide. Don't get me wrong, but <clears throat> they're like our investi investi uh, investigative uh, arm of the law, also. And mm. uh, I just couldn't believe it. it took me so long to get in touch with him. And I'd call, get emails, uh, anything I could possibly do to to contact him. It took five years, and it wasn't until that one show that I went on, and he agreed to be on the show with me, and he verified it and sent me an email. So. That's the, you know, the best verification that I have so far until my partner, Michael Johnson, uh, is found or located, whatever his it's, status it may be. It's, it's interesting as well because Mario's experience, uh, this is just my own personal theory, but, it, but right at the beginning of the, the whole Majestic 12 saga, which Rick Doty absolutely had a hand in, what Bill Moore you can take Bill Moore with a grain of salt. Um, but he what uh -huh. he says is the um the first link in the chain of MJ12 was the Ellsworth hoax, 
which was a, a hoax sent to yeah, the National Enquirer, which which has very similar dates to Mario's experience, but but it's a totally different, not completely different, but all of the names are changed. The incident details are a little bit funny. You know, they got a lot of a, a lot of um, details incorrect, names incorrect. Um, in this report that they sent to the National Enquirer. But it was interesting to me, and that's why I first reached out to Mario, is that the timing of that, Mario had an experience in the same month, the same year, that this hoax document is typed up and sent to the National Enquirer. Rick Doty claims to this day that he had nothing to do with it, but a lot of people have speculated that he did have something to do with it. And whether or not that was some form of disinformation to cover up a very real experience is um, something, you know, to an interesting angle. I think, uh, honestly, looking back at it now, you know, I was, as I've told Martin in the past, and I believe you also, Millie Louise, was the fact that I almost felt as if we had done something wrong. And and I'm going to say we because it was two of us. But yet we were we were so separated at that particular time, Michael Johnson being in the state of mind in which he was <clears throat> at that time. After, and after my examination with the flight surgeon's office, uh, you know, I had still not had any communication with Michael Johnson since we, as we had been separated back at November uh, control when, when I brought him back in. And, uh, you know, he made no type of uttering of any words or. I mean, really, it was just like somebody was being carried around as if they were incoherent. Mm. But <clears throat> I think that my incident shook them so, so to the bone that this this other incident that Rick Doty had a part in later within the same month, that, however, and it had to be within two or three weeks that this other incident took place where I guess the National Enquirer came out, they were seeking people, but of course they were briefings following the next couple of days to all security police personnel. And mind you, there were approximately 800 on that base, just in security and in missiles. <clears throat> Excuse me, this pollen down here is really bad. Mm-hmm. But uh, I was immediately taken from November control and sent to the alternate command post only with supervision for the rest of my tour there at Kilo control and never allowed i was never a team leader again i was always a member uh from that time forward until eight months later when i was departed to osan air base in south korea Mm. and uh the things that happened then you know of course with cattle mutilations they were going on national Enquirer did come out into the areas of the missile field but you know they were so well patrolled by supervision that even media representatives from the base, you know, would, would come and give briefings of which I was part of at one point, at one time at a, at a guard mount, you know, that we were not to ever speak with anybody about any incidents or anything flying in the air or cattle mutilations or anything else that was going on. So that was a, that was a real strange time. It, it honestly was. And there was so many feelings going on within myself as to what had happened to me. You know, and what happened to Michael Johnson? He showed up two weeks later, 18 days maybe, at my at my apartment in Rapid City at Hainesway Apartments, and we discussed everything and drew pictures. And then when he said what he said about what he heard, you know, <laughs> do not fear, do not fear. Mm. I knew he was coherent at least to hear those things. But yeah, I think there was something ramped up as far as being fake because. Uh, what what was the incident exactly about an alien running across a missile site and somebody yeah it was a, a alien alien yeah. was there alien came down yeah. sh- with a gun shot yeah that's shot, BS. shot i mean that's shot so yeah. that's BS. That's BS. Yeah. That, believe me the whole all of sac would have known strategic air command that would have been a huge incident had that really yeah. happened you can't, of course you can't fire yeah. round off you know yeah well, Mario, great, great talking to you. And so we're going to be catching up soon. I love it. Can't wait to see you. And thank yeah. you for having me. Emily Louise, great to hear you too. You too. Take care. Great to talk to you, Mario. Okay. You too. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Uh, so, yeah, interesting. Uh, so the line's still open. Hopefully uh, Chris Lambright will call in. But uh, one of the things, uh, you know, we, we were talking along the lines of these stories that are just so out there. I believe 
that and you said that people want to believe and and I, I agree with you when it comes to a lot of things especially some parts of this topic but i find that the more fantastic and wacky story is out there the more people get interested mm. in it and and yeah. I'm not sure if it's uh, escapism or what it is that makes people attracted to these these stories, these stories the way they are. I think, I mean, there's definitely an element of escapism. That's one thing that I've found while recent, like I said, the, the secret space program stuff. There's a lot of these people, you know, I try and think about it as, it, as if like, if you're living a life that, that, you know, isn't particularly the way you want it to be, um, you know, you've got all manner of financial concerns, um, you might have healthcare difficulties, um, your job doesn't pay you very much, you know, like all of these, you know, like material um, things going on in your life, it is a very um, appealing form of escapism. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. especially for a lot of these people especially for like secret space program stuff which is like really we really when you get into like the elaborate stories um because it allows people to feel like they are a super soldier and that they also have some form of control and that that they can kind of leave leave the world behind the world that isn't very um you know appealing um, and yes. there's a lot of issues you know yeah. um yeah. And and kind of create this this fantasy world. So a lot of and it's and it, and it is very similar to how people get sucked into religious cults. And mm -hmm. and I genuinely do believe that everybody is susceptible. I really don't buy into any of the ideas of oh, you've, if you believe in this, you must be an idiot. Or if you fall for this scam, you're an idiot. Or if you fall for this cult, uh, you you, are, you know whatever. All no, it I takes agree. is. Yeah. Is one one trauma, one bad thing to exactly. happen that we all will go push through, you over the edge. We all go through times in our life where we're vulnerable. And yeah, exactly. if they just happen to be looking for something at that time and something appears, then yes, um, any yeah. of us could get into Scientology or any other. I mean, you know, I'm exactly. just trying to think of, you know, the the Jones situation, you know, the way back then. People are looking for uh for for that and it seems like the predatory style of some of these people they can sense it they can see yes. someone sitting on a park bench and know right away to go over to yeah. that person and hey and know. i feel like and i feel like there's a lot of um there's a lot of that in the ufo world and i know that a lot I, and i i'm I don't mean it to sound disparaging towards anybody because I genuinely like I have a love for this topic as well but I think there's a lot of people that do just have like a I want to believe um and and it kind of gets taken advantage of um by bad actors yes I agree 100 percent so we have Chris Chris Lambright on the line Chris welcome hey Martin how are you I'm doing good and uh thank you for the connection with Emily Hi. All right. Hi, Emily. How are you? Nice to talk to you again. I'm good. How are you? Oh, fine so far, I guess, for a Tuesday. <laughs> good. Yeah, no, I was just listening to what you were saying, and, and you, you're absolutely correct that, I mean, obviously you don't want to be disparaging against people, but you remind me of something that I think of quite often, which is the problem with this whole UFO area of interest isn't the UFOs. It's the people. Yes, exactly. All of us want, and so many of us have these convictions and things that we want, but getting people to be willing to look in the mirror and at least acknowledge to themselves, you know, that given somebody with enough interest and not to bring up CIA people and operations and otherwise, but whose whole goal is to know what it is that's going to get to you. Your weak yeah. point, hook you in that right way. So it's the bait that's laid out there it means all of us are susceptible to it. Absolutely. And one thing to believe whatever you want, but if you're willing to believe whatever you want and not have any real problem with what the truth is, well, nobody's going to be able to help you if, if you even wanted it. Exactly. Well, Chris, the pro yeah. I right wish I could part. find that quote I had that you sent me a text a while back, and that was something along the lines 
that whatever rabbit hole you want to go down through, you can find it on Facebook to, you know, some type of group on Facebook that yes. will support your beliefs and let you go all the way with it. And uh, which is kind of, kind of dangerous in a You're lot of ways. Right. In the old days, I mean, even in the, in the old days when you used to go to a pub, a public house, you're going to hear different opinions from everyone. And like yep. it or not, when you're when you're in a group like that where everybody's going to tell you what they want, you're going to at least have to hear it all. You're not isolated. These days on the on on the internet, you're going to and I understand we all you know we all listen to the UFO forums because that's the only place we're going to go to have people with similar interests. But if you get down that rabbit hole where you find yourself into a forum with only people who are going to be speaking what you want to hear, what you believe. And that's, of course, the whole point of propaganda is to catch you where you believe. And that's what you go back to all the time. And that's the only place that you go back for information. You have a skewed viewpoint, not only exactly. the reality, but to the most extent what you believe anyway. And Emily, that's the one thing I've liked so much about your shows is you do. And I've heard this from other people who use this to describe you. You do a deep dive. You go way beyond just the surface area and looking into what, you know, what the bottom underlying facts are. And unfortunately, not many people do that. It's the difference between people that are analytical and superficial. And too many people want to be entertained, you know, the old 15 minutes kind of till the next channel comes on or something else. And I wish, I wish more people would actually do that kind of a deep dive into their own beliefs. Same. And the, the thing that I realized about UFOs a long ago was, sure, there have been plenty of times that I've questioned why I'm, you know, why am I into this? But <laughs> the reality is, if you go deep enough, you will find there is something to it. But, <laughs> but a lot of the superficial stuff that's on the surface, you'll have bypassed that long ago. You'll still come up with a conviction, but but it's what do you want to believe? Do you want to know that you believe in something that's real? Or do you just want to have a good time joining a Facebook group where everybody's going to tell you whatever you want to hear? Exactly. Well, yeah, uh, frustrating, but. Couldn't agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more. And I noticed that somebody in the chat called me a debunker. And I was like, I'm not a debunker. I, I just am interested in what is the actual truth of the story. And I feel like over the years there's been, and it's and it's absolutely the fault of some skeptics, because some skeptics behave absolutely abhorrently. And they're also like completely clouded with dogma and I myself have probably been guilty of that in the past when I've you know come to an opinion and then you know maybe been a bit too like this is my opinion but I think it's important to um like differentiate between like being somebody that is just out to debunk and somebody that is skeptical and I think like I said, like there are some debunkers I think just are give the entire I don't know if it's a field, but the field of skepticism or the act of skepticism, a bad name. And that really infuriates me because in, in this field, ufology, that is full of um, bad actors, I think that skepticism is one of the most important um, like things that you, you should practice, right? Like ask people questions, or ask the people that are telling you these stories that are coming forward with with different encounters, interrogate them. And you can do it in a really, you can do it in a respectful way. You don't have to get on your high horse about it. Um, you can you can do it in a way that is kind of, you know, like a bit more polite. So, yeah, you're absolutely correct. It's fair for everyone to have their own opinion, you know, but at the same time, be open to hearing what the other side, if you want to call it that, is actually saying, because yeah. they may have a valid point that you haven't considered. Yeah. I don't really have a problem with skeptics. It's just I accept that there's this huge bell curve. And as much as ufology has the true believer woo-woo crowd out on that end, there's the other side that is the skeptical side that they have planted their foot firmly in that domain and they've become figures of their own in the skeptical crowd Absolutely. and now they cannot change their opinion or their mind yes. or even say something because they've they're too vested in being skeptics 
and, and they never I seem think. to account for like disinformation either they always just yeah, they they never seem to take that into into account it's always just people making up stories it's never that the stories could be planted deliberately for nefarious purposes you know, you're, you're absolutely right and it, part of my thought about this whole topic is the way to basically quiet down everything is to put so much garbage out there both sides both the skeptics and the other side that nobody is going to really know what to think there's so much <laughs> yeah. confusion over it and so you have the skeptics that are planting their own feelings about things out there and let's face it given enough time 20 or 30 years later everybody is second guessers they can come up with some even vaguely plausible rationale to dismiss any kinds of cases. I mean, I'm thinking of the Arrow report that came out not long ago. There are questions right. that I have and that a lot of people have, but you realize they didn't go so far back to no. find those historic cases that were still in modern times. Mm -hmm. that their, their own predecessors weren't stupid. They were smart people who were careful in the investigation. And in most cases, for the most part, wanted to come up with a good, plausible explanation and couldn't. But the way, to, the way to avoid that in the error report is don't bring it up. You know, there's like hey, Chris, 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 I, I'm you. sorry. I have to say, Chris, we're, we're right up against the time here. But oh, uh, okay. and sorry to cut you short, but uh, okay. yeah, we're running right out of town, <laughs> out of time. And right. thanks again. Thanks I really appreciate I the call. <laughs> and, thanks, Martin. All right. And uh, Bye, yeah, and appreciate the uh, connection too. Bye, All right. Chris. Talk to you later, Chris. All right. So, yeah, I mean, we're coming up. So I just wanted to tell, you know, the listeners that I have to drop right out at uh, in just like three and a half minutes from now. And when I do uh, meet me over to the next stream on the YouTube channel, which is uh, with Mark D'Antonio and Forrest Crawford uh, coming right up at eight o'clock sharp. So uh, you're I just let everyone know that your channel is linked down in the show notes and in the text below and yes. in YouTube and, and Facebook and all that. And so how long would you say, what's the longest it has taken you to put together one of those videos? Oh my God. Like the alternative three one took me like near, uh, maybe like six months. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I could tell, I could tell with, with all the work. Yeah. Yeah. You put it's into a it. lot. Yeah. yeah. And uh, no, I wouldn't, I would, I'm just going to give an example of, of, I guess, you know, some people are saying that Mick West is a total debunker and some people saying he's a healthy skeptic. Mm -hmm. I think he's leaning a little toward debunking. And I will mm -hmm. tell you just one real quick story. I had Kevin Day on in, on the show from the Tic Tac and completely was able to uh, come in agreement with Mick West that Mick West said, yes, you're right. That is not what it is. That is not an airplane. You 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 got me there because I didn't realize this particular thing. And then mm -hmm. a week later, he was out saying the thing all over again, like it never happened with Kevin Day, and he's still saying it today. The same the same situation. Oh, so I mean, that to me is more of a debunker. Someone that yeah. just hangs on to their own. Anyone that hangs on to their own, whatever it is, after they know the truth, uh, is in either way, whether it's UFOs or not, is Absolutely. never a good thing. But thank you so much, Emily. It's been a real pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It was really nice to talk to you. All right. You take care now. Thank you. Bye. Right. All right, everyone. So I'm going to be going right over to the next channel with Mark D'Antonio. Next week, uh, we have Robert Powell. I'm going to be out to sea, so that'll be a, a pre-recorded show. And uh, thanks so much. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky. I just have to find. Here it is. Thank you.